It is just a huge honor to be in Sydney, Australia and have Dr. Alex Abrahams come by the hotel room to film a podcast with me and Ryan. This is going to be a big treat for you. Dr. Alex Abrahams, general dentist with special interest in implants and oral surgery, co-founder of Pacific Smile Groups, which now is an ASX listed branded dental service organization with over 70 dental centers in four states on the east coast of Australia with over 350 dentists practicing from Pacific Smiles Group centers. ASX is their New York stock exchange, their NASDAQ. How many stocks are listed on the ASX? Oh, that's a question without notice, Howard. Unfair. Uh, I know, 2,000. 2,000? Yeah. Unbelievable. Currently retired from clinical practice, but Alex runs implant education for general dentists in Pacific Smiles Group via a one-year mentorship course, has a role of non-executive director in Pacific Smiles Group, and as a strategic and dental intelligent consultant to the group. One of the things I have found most interesting, I, I, I love this uh, Dentistry and Center podcast series more than uh, really anyone because I'm probably the only person who's listened to all 800 episodes, <laughs> but I, I have learned so much. And one of the biggest problems with um, corporate dental chains around the world um, is associate turnover, but it's no different in private practice. I mean, I'm 54. I've had my practice for 30 years. I consider in the last 30 years, it was really good when associates stayed seven to 10 years. Mm. But for every associate that stays seven to 10 years, another one just stays a year or two. Mm. And when I look at the, um, we, there's, I, I always tell solo practicing dentists, you could learn a lot from corporate dentistry. Yeah. And the corporate dentistry with the lowest associate turnover like Heartland Dental Group in America mm. or you over here in Australia is you have a continuing education mentorship program for the associates and they, they um, so the associate says well if I take a job here they're gonna put me through a two-year implant course and at the end of two years um, I will have placed you know so many you know maybe 50 yeah. implants well, or I want to go work for this doctor because he's going to teach me sleep apnea. Or there, yeah. it's it's a mentorship program, and yeah. that's what you figured out with Pacific Smile. Yeah. So the two key things there are, uh, they come out of university, they have a ticket to practice, but they're not confident to practice. They need a bit of hand holding and a bit of mentorship, and sometimes in a small practice they'll get that, but the principal might be too busy treating patients to take time out to do that. Well, so they, we, we have structured mentorship programs from new graduates right through to these implant dentists. Now, just give you an example of the power of the implant dentists. Five years ago, in the Pacific Smiles Group, we're doing 150 implants a year. Now I've trained over 60 implant dentists and we're doing over 1,000 implants a year, purely on the back of our course. So that attracts people to our group because they know they can get a bit extra. Well, but, the, the, in private practice, it's actually worse if I'm placing a bunch of implants mm. and I hire you as an associate, you come work for me because you want to learn implants. And then what the older doctor does says, no, you no, no. do all the fillings and crowns and I'm going to do all the implants. So he just uses the kid to do all the minor basic stuff. Mm. And the kid came on because he wanted to learn the big cases. And the, the, uh, the older associates that are keeping these kids for a long time yeah. are yeah. saying, no, you do some of these yeah. big cases. Yeah. So that's why we started, how we got ahead in 20, even before Pacific Smiles, is in the practices I was in, we always said that the new dentist, the young dentist, the associate dentist gets the patients before the principals do. Because we had our own source of patients anyway from our loyal patients. So all the new patients would go to them and we didn't put any caveats on what they could do. They could only do, they could do to their ability and we helped to improve their ability. So we don't have any ties to them to tell them what they should do or what they should not do. They've got to be comfortable in what they can do. So all our dentists in Pacific Smiles are actually independent. They're using us like a doctor might use a private hospital. So we as a dental services organization are engaging dentists who are essentially in business for themselves. Do you get that? Yeah. So they build the patient we collect the fees on their behalf from the patient and then we charge them a service fee. So they feel good about being business and 
in business for themselves. They get their own tax deductibility, their own flexibility around superannuation and things like that. So they feel like they're a business owner, a small business owner within our bigger organization. For Pacific Smiles Group? Yeah. How, how many offices do you have? Uh, there's over 70, 71 I think, last count. 71? Yeah. And what is the what is the business relationship? Is it do you do you own it 50-50, 60-40? Who owns the office? So this is where we're different. Pacific Smiles owns each office 100%. We have the lease on the building, we do the fit out, we hire the staff, we buy the materials, we do the marketing, um, we do the maintenance and repairs. The dentist comes in and gets all these services that we provide them for about 60% of what they produce. So they get to keep the other 40%. So you pay your doctors 40% of production or 40% of collection? Collections after lab fees. Collections co after lab fees? Yeah, we call so it who, direct costs like implants. So who pays the lab fees? The dentist pays the lab fees. Okay, so say it again. So the dentist is paid 40% yeah. minus the lab fees? No, well, let, let's do it another way. It, say he bills a patient $1,100 and he has a hundred dollar lab fee on that. So what uh, we charge him is 60% of that $1,000. So it's 1,100 minus the hundred dollar lab fee, then we use the net receipts, we call it net receipts figure, to do our calculation of the percentage on. So the doctor pays the lab fee? Yeah, but and it comes off the top to get you to a okay, net okay, so so. Let's say um, I do a crown in the United States for six hundred dollars, and the lab fee. Well, that's the average. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, okay, it, that's okay. another day. Then, well, well, here's the only thing. Okay. What what is a U.S. dollar to? Okay, uh, one U.S. dollar equals uh, what? 80, 80, eighty cents. Yeah. Okay, so so eighty cents. So so when I got out of school thirty years ago, a crown was a thousand dollars. Yeah. You would submit your thousand dollars, and the insurance pay half. Right. Now the insurance companies send you the fee, and 95% of the dentists in America take Delta Dental, and Delta Dental gives you the fee. So that's right. called a PPO. Yeah, yeah. And now, 30 years later, uh, Delta only pays me 600 for a crown. Right. So let's say my associate does a crown. So let's say I do a crown for $600. You pay me 40%. The lab fee is 100. So you would take the six hundred dollars minus the hundred, so that'd be five hundred. Yep. Then I would get forty percent of five hundred. Of forty percent of five hundred. Yeah. And that is very, very critical. Dot the I and cross T because when the doctor pays the lab bill, he'll send it to Glidewell and get a ninety-nine dollar Bruxer crown. When you don't have the dentist pay the lab bill, he'll send it to Idaho and have Matt Roberts the greatest cosmetic dental laboratory technician on earth, make the crown for 350. Yeah. But what do they care? Yeah. Economic incentives matter hugely. They, they're just very huge. So you can't pay um, the dentist on production, not collection, because then they're not gonna do a financial arrangement. They'll just seat down Molly Brown and do a crown on her. And then when she checks out, it turns out she doesn't have any money, she can't get care credit, she doesn't have a credit card. So you got to pay on collections, not production. Yeah, definitely. And they, they have to have skin in the game because yeah. monkeys... And they, they get to choose which lab they want to use. So if they want to sure. use an expensive lab... They can use any lab they want because yeah. they're going to pay for it. Yeah. 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 So so um, so 40% of collection minus the lab fee. Yeah. Yeah. Is what you well, pay. It's collections minus the lab fee times 40%. Collections minus lab fee times 40%. Now... Now remember, they're independent, they're working for themselves, so we turn it upside down and we charge them 60%. So it's a little bit of a technicality, but they're not employees. And do you do that for tax purposes? Uh, we do it for a few, it does help them from a tax point of view, and it gives them more flexibility around their own superannuation and things like that. We do it from a liability point of view. So we as the dental services organization or the dental corporate do not have the um, the medical sovereignty liability. So if, if if an employee dentist splits a lip or something like that. Or uses IV sedation and the person doesn't wake up. Yeah, okay, that's an extreme case. But that's because what you gotta we cover employed, yourself for. Because we employed them, it's our insurance that looks after it. 
But in our situation, they're in business for themselves. They're buying services from us, just like they might buy service from in any sort of associateship. Uh, so they're buying services from us. So if they split the lip or do an IV sedation and not wake up, it's on their professional indemnity insurance. It's very, it's, it's quite important to have that. I think dentists need to really um, talk about the extreme case because with social media, in a big mm. country like America with a third of a billion people, at least once a month, some kid's not waking up from That's right, sedation. from wisdom teeth, yeah. Wisdom teeth and pediatric dentists, oral yeah. surgeons, in some of these cases, um, some of these cases, it's a pediatric dentist specialist. Yeah. So he's got a DDS and an MS degree specialist, and they had a board certified anesthesiologist. Because if you put a million kids under, yeah, some some are not going to wake so up. Especially have an undiagnosed something that especially uh, goes five wrong. and under and eighty five and over. Yep, those are high risk mm. every single time. Mm. And these dentists have to realize that um, um, you're, 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 you're gambling and it's, it's high risk. And there's a lot of dentists yeah. who have yeah. lost everything from this yeah. happening. Yeah. And I, I've never done it. I mean, these, yeah. a lot of these dentists go to a weekend course at the Holiday Inn and next thing they're doing is they're doing sedation and they don't realize that's, that's yeah. a huge. So it's a, it's a risk mitigation from right. us as the corporate. Remember, we're listed on the stock market. We don't want any we have a risk matrix. We have do to uphold. Do you let your doctors do IV sedation? In certain, no, not, not as the uh, sedationist. We'll get in a uh, specialist anesthetist, we call them, uh, to do the sedation. But we do have some sedation happening in some of our rooms. But you have a board certified anesthesiologist coming in. Yeah, 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 yeah. And but we're very careful to limit it to ASA. 12 year olds to 60 year olds. Is yeah. that we your protocol? We Is won't it? go down there. Our, our anesthetist said we don't want to go under 12. So we said fine. You are, I mean that, you just what he just said is so infinitely um, intelligent. You can tell he's publicly traded and owns 70 dental offices. Cause that, that's a caveat that, that people don't realize how, like when you talk to an anesthesiologist, like when you put a child under five, I mean their, their lung capacity, their lungs are so small, the reserve oxygen so low. A kid can go from 95% oxygen saturation to 5% like that, yeah. but not on two older dogs mm. uh, like us. But So you, you won't go under 12 and you won't go over 65, yeah. so you can only put me asleep for 11 more years. That's fine. And then I got to go to New Zealand? No, no, we still will go to private hospitals and <laughs> do a lot of general anesthetics in private hospitals. You won't have so to. That's you just the full, the Ryan, full, full... Just tell Ryan that you need me knocked out. He'll hit me over the head with a <laughs> shovel without blinking. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to talk about another point. You talking about your publicly traded. Why is it? So you remember um, back in the day, 30 years ago in America, the orthodontic centers of America, first big roll up, big line of credit, buying all these orthodontic okay. offices, publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange, fabulously imploded yeah. um, with Liz, uh, Lazarus. Um, and there's so many, how many publicly traded DSOs are on the ASX? Uh, there's two on the ASX. And what are they? Uh, one 300 miles. One 300 miles. Basically in Queensland and us as Pacific and you, Smiles Group. Okay. There's one, in, there's a, uh, the Australian arm of a New Zealand listed um, DSO, which is the Urbano Group. Uh, say that again, Urbano? Urbano. A-B-A-N-O. Urbano. So they have um, dental offices in New Zealand and Australia. The Australia ones, have been what we would term a roll up where they've purchased existing practices. And I want to talk about this because we don't do that. Yeah, but first, we, but first, before we go there, I want to talk about why do you think there are no, uh, there's 35 corporate dental chains in America that yeah. have over 50 locations. Right. Why are none of them publicly traded on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange? Oh, are you asking me that yeah. question? Um, I don't know. Well, you tell me. Well, I think it's because th this is what I've been told. So, um, do you get the movie, uh, the the show Shark Tank over here? Uh, uh, yes, I've heard of it, but I've never watched okay, it. Okay. Well, so 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 basically, um, a roll up. Yeah. They go get a line of credit for a million dollars. Yeah. 
Use other people's money. Yeah, so use other people's buy money. Offices. And they'll go buy an office for a million dollars and they'll say, hey, look at us. We went from zero to a million sales. Yeah. And Wall Street's saying, yeah, you also went from yeah. zero to a million in debt. Yeah, that, that, so that, now let's talk about that. Yeah, let's talk about that. And then they say, well, give us 10 more million dollars. Yeah. So they go buy 10 more offices for a million and say, look at us. We've gone from 1 million to 10 million. They go, yeah, but look at your debt sheet. It's gone from 1 million to 11 million. So they, they grow their revenue. They buy revenue. They buy, they buy revenue. And Wall with other people's money. Yeah, they're buying revenue with other people's money. And then when they buy my office, I'm a 54-year-old dog doing it for 30 years. And then I leave and then you replace me with some associate that just walked out of a dental school. And um, I see it with Orthodox Centers of America. see it all the time because... Yeah, with Orthodox Centers of America, some of these doc, some of these Orthodox were doing two, three million a year. Yeah. And then when he left, they got some Orthodox out of school and yeah. he only did a million a year. Yeah. So that's what everyone does in the medical um, corporatization. They do roll-ups. So they buy the earnings, put the guy on five-year contract or three-year contract or four-year contract and hope that they can flog the business within that five years to get their payday. But the thing they fail to realize is that when we buy, when, when, when a, uh, a dental services organization buys another practice, they're buying their culture, they're buying their systems, they're buying their people, and they're buying, they're giving a big bag of money to the Dr. Ferran guy who suddenly pays off all these debts and goes on holidays and then has to work on 30% or something like that for a while and starts to get jack of it because he can't make any decisions. Then they come in and they start saying, you're spending too much money on composites here, so we want you to use black and gold brand composite. And so then the aggro starts up because they're starting to tell the doctor what to do. So we know this and we don't do this. So you, you only do de novo practices? You we build we, practices from scratch? We will scratch. build practices from scratch. So all 70 of your offices were built from Not scratch? Not all. Some of the early ones. The uh, the foundation centers, there were three of those. Well, how, how old is your company? How, how long has it been in? Existence? 2003 we started. 2003 to 2017. Ryan, you've had calculus. What is that? What did you say? 2003? 2003 <laughs> to 2017. So 14, 14 years. So, 14 years, you have 70 offices. Yeah, we've gone from 3 to 70. We've gone 71, from 3 I think, now. to 71. Yeah. And of those 71, how many were de novo? Uh, so, this is a rollout you're, you're talking about. We, we would turn that a rollout. Where we, we, a rollout we, is a de novo? Rollout, yeah. Okay, so um, about uh, 62 or 3 of those would be... How much, 63? 63 would I like be, that. be I've never establishing heard. a new fact. Okay, I've never well, here heard you go. Roll out, but okay, I, roll I out. like roll out. It's the opposite. So of there's roll up, roll up, and there's so so roll nice. up is you're, you're basically That's buying goodwill. Than the word de novo. You're buying you're buying goodwill, right? So your 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 practice is is worth two or three million dollars based on your good on your production and your earnings, not on your goods or chattels. Not on my goods or chattels. Goods or chattels, well, the equipment and everything else. What's you know? a chattel? Well. Uh, Property, uh, yeah, your stuff in, inside the building, you know, the, the, the fixed assets. You, yeah. It's an intangible. With a rollout, or as you say, de novo, there's no goodwill. You establish your practice, might cost you $600,000 to do the fit out and the equipment and the x ray equipment and everything like that. Then you'll spend some money on marketing it and you'll spend some money on, on, working capital in the first year because you are going to lose money in the first year. So you lose money in the first year till you get it to about eight, nine hundred thousand dollars in turnover and then you start making money out of it. But because you've you've designed it as you want to design it, you've designed it like a McDonald's would be designed. You know, all cookie cutter stuff. Okay? So it's all Predictable. What's in the top drawer in all our centers is identical. What's in the second drawer is identical. I can go into any of our offices and see a patient come in without having opened a drawer ahead of time to know what's in there. And so that's, what, all that's, what Mark, all that's what Mark Costas does. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. There's a, another dentist friend of mine who has a podcast. He has a dozen offices. Yeah. And he um, every dental office, every drawer, yeah. same thing. So, but... Over a few years, you get this place up to being worth several million dollars, but you only p paid 600000 for it. But here's the good thing, is that when the dentist comes in, 
the way the drawers are, the materials that we have, everything, they accept it as being that's the way we do business around here. Rather than coming in and saying, I don't like using that software, I want some other software, they don't get that opportunity. They don't bother asking. So we attract that. Okay, I want to, I want to, more specifics also. Um, one of the problems with roll ups is um, these older dental offices yep. that are 30 years old, they have all these legacy employees that got a raise every year for 30 years yep. and they're, their overhead is off the charts because yeah. of labor. What do you think, give us your goals for overhead. Where, what do you like to see overhead at? Okay, um, this is this is broad, but I, I, as a percentage of patient fees, mm -hmm. your staff costs might be 19, 20%. Wow, so, okay. Uh, consumable costs might be five and a half percent. Consumable supplies? Uh, yeah, yeah, dental materials. Supplies, uh, 5%? Five and a half percent, yeah. 5.5? Yeah. Okay. Uh, your yeah, electricity, your utilities, and things like that might be two to three percent. Okay. Um, Doctor that, compensation. Well, that that's the yeah you know, thirty five to forty percent. So it's um, collection minus lab bill minus forty yeah, well, percent. Yeah. Okay, it, but it, that it, it varies a little bit depending on the experience. And the but that varies in your uh, it varies 70 a bit. offices yeah, to be between varies a bit. 35 and 40 percent or what, what oh what even higher well, some some are some of the guys who are doing the the general anesthetic and iv work and implant work are doing 43 44 percent okay so um so sta so what about rent well that varies uh some of our rents are down near two percent some are up near ten percent okay. we, we we tend to the last five or six years we've been rolling out in shopping centers and what is your definition of a shopping center? Is that a mall? A mall, yeah, you call it a mall. So it's a shopping center, enclosed roof, seven day trading. It's where the people are. So what we're doing now is putting more and more of our centers in and that's shopping doing good. malls. That's, is and that, that doing well? We're getting good foot traffic and they do well from the get go because we're also doing seven days a week. So you as a family will go to that shopping center once or twice a week, do your groceries or a, a bit of um, uh, dress shopping or shoe shopping or something like that and you walk past a Pacific Smile Centre. Oh, that's nice, there's a dentist there, but I don't need one. But then on the weekend, Johnny gets hit in the mouth with a soccer ball and, and a split lip and a loose tooth and they say, ah, oh, there's a dentist down at the shopping centre. I'll go down there or I'll ring them up. So this is about putting the patient at the centre of our business. Not patient the doctor. focus. It's a patient not doctor focused centered focus. business where we want to be accessible, available, and affordable for the patient. And therefore say the three things then accessible. Accessible. Available. And affordable. Now affordable doesn't mean cheap, Howard. Affordable means we're going to work with the health fund. Affordable mean, might be a payment scheme um, uh, and the like. So it doesn't mean cheap dentistry, it means that we will work with them with their budgets and stage things that'll suit them. Accessible now, um, means that easy to find, easy parking, and available means we've got urgent care spots every day, we're available seven days a week um, and some evenings a week. So it's a, what it's a patient do centered. Your, does Pacific Smiles Group, do they all have the same hours? Pretty well, most of them now are now seven days. Uh, we still have... What, what are the hours? Uh, it'll go from 8.30 to 6 o'clock. 8 a.m. to 6 p.m.? Uh, yeah, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. The weekends are a bit shorter. What are the, what are the weekends? Uh, they'll be uh, 9 till 4. For Saturday and Sunday? Yeah, maybe Saturday a bit longer. So, and so we do one evening a week, one or two evenings so a week. So do you know, um, you know, you know the convenience store 7-Eleven? Yeah. Do you know where that name came from, 7-Eleven? Yeah, seven days a week, 11 hours a day. No, it was 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Oh, okay. And now they're renaming them um, 7.24. Yeah. For seven days a week, 24 hours a day. All right. So, so um, again, this is about making it good for the patient. Now, it's a challenge to get the dentist to do that. But what do dentists want, Howard? Dentists want a full book. They want a well-trained nurse. And they want good gear and materials to work with. So if you can give them a well-trained nurse, and we have training programs for our nurses, you can give them a full book, um, they will happily work in our system 
and not get itchy feet and want to move on. Nice. The other thing we do is our other customer group, we talked about the patient as our customer group, our other customer group is the dentist. We respect the dentist, we give them medical sovereignty, that means they've got their decision making over what they do in, 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 in their choices of treatment for the patient, we don't interfere with that. We give them a pathway of education that can get them up to doing implants on a regular basis. Why would you want to go and own your own shop with lots of hassles? So um, you have 71 locations. Yeah. How many dentists work in the 71 locations? How yeah. many dentists work for you? About 350. So um, how many dentists per office? It varies. We've got one in the center of Sydney here in uh, uh, Hunter Street, corner of Pitt and Hunter Street with 18 chairs and that could have 16 dentists operating. So you don't have day. a standard... No, the shopping center ones tend to be three to four chairs. But the one I work at, or recently worked at, till I retired up at Green Hills in the Hunter Valley, um, has 10 chairs. And okay, probably... I want to ask you, I want to play true or false. Some of the corporate chains in America say that um, in all their locations that have four or five or six chairs, one dentist. Like it might be six chairs, like maybe oh. two mm -hmm. hygienists, the doctor works on two or three rooms and has an emergency deal. So we'll say a five, a five chair deal. When one dentist, their HR problems are almost zilch. Mm. Whenever they go to two dentists or three dentists, their HR goes to the roof because humans are very tribal. They follow the 400 pound gorilla. Mm. And when you got one 400 pound gorilla saying he believes this and diagnoses this way, and the other 400 pound gorilla dentist diagnosed this way, and the, the two gods, you know, most religions yeah, are yeah. monotheistic yeah. because yeah. what happens when you have a god of lightning and a god of thunder? Yeah, right. Um, do you find in your mall clinics where you have two or four chairs with one doctor, do you find those far easier to manage from an HR point of view uh, than when you go to group practice with three or four egomaniac doctors? Okay. We, we, the size is not reflective of the difficulty to manage that place. It all comes down to the centre manager and the regional manager. And our centre managers are not dentists. Uh, a lot of people call them practice managers, but we actually call them centre managers. They're doing more than just managing the practice. They're managing all the HR. They're managing all the um, culture of that site. They're, they're managing all the So two the or more doctors and is no, not an HR. And here's the other thing is we don't have hygienists. Uh, it, generally in this country, hygienists are not used like they're used in America. So in America, you have a lot more hygienists per, per doctor. Uh, we would only have two four or five hygienists across the whole group. Because our dentists are independent and they do, they like to do the hygiene themselves. So when we have a, um, a six chair practice, say on the central coast here at Tugra, we have six dentists in there, no hygienists. So you're probably saying we've got six 400 pound gorillas, but they're in their own little independent world, seeing their patients, billing their patients, and as long as we provide all the services to them, they're happy. They're happy. I go back to the full book, good staff, good materials, good equipment, and well, flexibility. The, the flexibility around their holidays and things like that. The what percent of the dental offices in Australia do use hygienists? So in the, um, I would say there'd be no more than twenty-five percent. Only a fourth of the dental offices have hygienists. They would tend to be the solo practitioners, where the the principal dentist um, would have one or two hygienists working more in the way that hygienists in America work. The problem in America is that the hygienists in Phoenix get $40 an hour yeah. and the insurance pays $45 for a cleaning. And I they mean, take an hour to do it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you, um, you, and you could pay, I mean, it's, 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 it's the same sim here. Simple math tells you that yeah. the yeah. reimbursement rates have, yeah. have, ex have killed the hygiene department. What, what, what's the hourly production of a hygienist in America? 100 bucks an hour. What's the hourly production of a dentist in America? Well, I'd, I'd hope it'd be 300. Yeah. So you, you cover your fixed costs much quicker with a dentist than you do with a hygienist. You've got no profit in hygienists. Now, they're nice people and they do a good job. I must say yeah, that up front. I know. I get into a lot of strife There's because a... I have been for 20 years saying it, the economics and the way we work as dentists in Australia do not support the use of hygienists. The most, co the most profitable chain in America is Comfort Dental with Rick Kirshner of Comfort Dental. They have mm -hmm. 350 locations and rule number one is no hygienist. There you go.
I've got to look him up. I'll go and see them. What's his yeah. name? Ray. Rick Kirshner. Rick, Rick Kirshner. Okay. Rick Kirshner. He's out of um, Denver, Colorado. Rick, if you're watching this, I'm coming. Yeah, I mean, he just says he says the same things. I love hygienist death. I'd love to get my teeth clean for an hour yeah. by hygienist, but I'm a rich guy and I pay in cash. Yeah. But the consumers are coming in with insurance, and the insurance um, supply and demand says the hygienist gets forty an hour, and the insurance going to pay forty. I mean, forty five for a cleaning. I mean, he says it's a square I, peg into a round hole. It just doesn't. Uh, it work. just doesn't work. So you have a dentist, and they do it, and it. Um, we make it work, but our dentists are not asking for hygienists. If they were, we could p supply them. But we you know what's them. really um, what's really interesting in America is um, they built up this um, this high production machine that started in the in the fifties and the sixties mm. and the seventies and the eighties when insurance was from unions mm. and was paying outrageously high prices. Like a thousand bucks for a crown, thousand bucks for a crown. So the prices have come down about forty percent in real dollars, but they still have this high overhead, expanded function, hygienists, assistants, whatever. And then when you look at these mature markets, um, they when you go around the world and look at these mature markets in Italy and Japan mm -hmm. and Singapore, it's the most profitable dentists are, are one chair, yep. no employees yep. except maybe uh, one person. That answers the phone, helps clean, whatever, and they might only do three fifty a year, but they'll take home two fifty of yeah, it. Yeah. And so, a lot of the dentists in America to take home two fifty, they have to do a million dollars yeah, of yeah. running around with all this it's it's almost like their priority is more about creating jobs. Yeah. for six or seven staff yeah. members, two of which are well, you, hygienists making $40 an you, hour. You would know the danger zone. So the one or two principal practice will do well. And the larger practices will do well. It's the middle zone where you've got uh, three or four dentists. I'm talking about private practices, three or four dentists, and what the dentists are doing are running around doing the management because they can't afford to employ managers. So while they're doing the management, they're not on the tools. So those are the, that's the danger zone, I call it. You either, either need to stay small or get big and get professional management in. And that's why Pacific Smile started, because we wanted to make sure dentists were doing dentistry and managers were being managers. So our, our mantra is that managers should manage, dentists should do dentistry, and shareholders should be shareholders. No partnerships, no associateship shareholders. And because it was set up as a, a PTY limited company in the first place, it had flexibility around ownership based on shares not on how much you build or anything like that. So that's why we started to make sure the dentist was doing 99% of their work by treating patients and that was better for the patient too. A lot of dentists believe that the way to attract patients is with a lot of expensive high technology like chair side milling. Do you think chair side milling same day dentistry is one of the reasons Pacific Smile Groups is so successful? We don't do chair side milling. Um, it's, 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 it's reasonable technology, but do you want to be a lab technician or do you want to be a dentist? A dentist. Right, so why are you taking time designing something on a machine? I know they pay $150,000 to be demoted from a doctor of dental surgery That's right. to a lab tech. So we, we got one for a trial for a while at, at Green Hills and three or four of the dentists, we learnt it all and we got it. And after a month I said to them, um, how's everyone going? Well, at first I said, oh, this is great. We can do this, this and this. Then after a month I said, how's it going? They said, um, we feel like we're a technician, a lab technician. Um, we'd rather do take the impression and send it to the lab. Patients aren't asking for it to be a day of it. It's not a marketing ploy for us. It's a service to the patient in some areas where um, they might be short of patients and everything is a CEREC. Everything that walks in the door is a CEREC. If you own a CEREC machine, guess what your patients are going to need? If you're paying the least payments on a CEREC, on a $200,000 CEREC machine, guess what treatment most of the patients are going to need? A CEREC. Because you've got to fund your lease payments. Now, what I do think with a big way of the future will be scanning intraoral scanning uh, will be, I think, the next big wave 
um, that we'll be looking at. Are, are you rolling out scanners? In Not yet. We're, we're looking at it. We're assessing it. From my looking at the market so far, all the scanners, the heads are too big. We keep well, saying that it's, uh, you know, you don't have to have an impression in your mouth for three or four minutes, but by golly, have you seen the size of the heads on some of those scanners? So until they get it down to about the size of a high-speed handpiece, I think um, we're still a way off. What is your um, what is your overhead goal for these 72, 71 locations? What, what do you like the average overhead to be per office? <laughs> After you pay... After we pay everyone. Everyone, dentists, everything. 20%, 20%. Is that your goal or is that what you not... No, that's our goal. Yeah, but what is the reality? Or better. The reality is a whole mixed bag because the new practices have have no margin on them. And after one year, in one to two years, they might have five percent margin, then they might have ten percent margin. So it takes time for these things. So, right. so overall, what, so what, we won't have what, the margin. What that, did you average for seventy-one offices last year? What well, what did twenty sixteen net profit average for seventy-one locations? So in terms of as a percentage of patient fees. It's around about uh, 18, 19 percent. 18, 19 percent? Yeah, yeah. So we have some that might be up near 25 percent, but then we've got some that are, as I said, Zero. all the new ones are low. But we're investing in the future. We're, we're, we're doing the long game, Howard. You talk about these roll-ups where they buy a practice. They buy a Howard Franz practice. What are you, 54? Where are you going to be in five years' time? It's got a use-by date on it, that practice. Our practices don't have use-by dates on them. In 100 years' time, there will still be a practice at 8 Molly Morgan Drive, Green Hills. Because it's built on um, a culture of its brand and its delivery of great dental services to patients, not on individual dentists. Of the 71 locations, what percent do you rent versus own land and building? We rent 71. Yeah, so because you're not in the real estate business. We're not in the real estate business. Right. So what's a return on real estate? Six, seven percent. And, and it's an illiquid asset for the whole life of the practice. That's right. What if you suddenly realize it's the wrong location where well, you just surrender your lease and take a no. lease somewhere else? Okay, so... Um, no, no, I'm not saying real estate's a bad investment, but for us, for Pacific well, Smart... Real estate, real estate is becoming a very bad investment oh, because yeah. with, with Amazon.com, yeah, yeah. as Amazon's revenue goes up for online trading, I mean, you drive around any American major city... Yeah. The most common tenant in every retail center is space available mm. because Amazon's cannibalizing yeah. all these yeah. uh, retail. But America locations. overbuilt. Your 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 um, your 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 population per square meter of mall space is three times Australia. Mm. So that's why you're shutting down your malls. That's not happening here. Yeah, but yeah. not just, uh, just. But I'm, yeah. I'm not Amazon's talking, coming. Yeah, I'm not talking just malls. I'm talking just all retail locations. I mean. So I've been in um, Phoenix for 30 years, and all the little shot, anything that can be sold on Amazon, like clothes, mm. re, you know, so many things, they're all gone now. Mm. It seems like the only thing that still um, has retail renting, um, you need a human involved, like yeah. restaurant to cook, yeah. 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 Uh, a human to cut your hair. So we're identifying human, this in the shopping centers. We do, a mani pedi. The, the shopping malls or centers we want to go into are ones where there's a food hall and there's cinemas and there's social engagement with people. There's there's um, uh, medical centers and things like that where you've got to go and dental centers. That's why the, the shopping center owners like having us there because there's another reason to drag people to the shopping center. We're mm -hmm. not a retailer. Well, retail is going to go where. You're going to need to um, explain what... There, there's going to need to be a human there. Yeah. A human's going to need to cook the food, yeah. cut my hair, fix yeah. my tooth, Drill touch me, yeah. manny petty. But if it's just, I'm going to take the... I'm going to buy this item, and I walk up to you and say, check me out, yeah. that's going to Amazon. I know, I know. You got to... You got, there needs to be a physical reason for that human yeah. to be yeah. in the mall. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm retail. not in a retail business. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a whole changing landscape. Okay, so what percent um, on um, for these 71 stores do you average for marketing? Um, so across the board, we would spend 1.5% of our turnover on marketing. So I want to go back to marketing because the best marketing is word of mouth. Right. We know that. Treat someone well and they'll tell a dozen people. In fact, in today's world, treat someone well with social media, they could tell 500 people who will tell another 500 people. So it's treating the patient that you've got in the chair well, giving them a, an experience 
which is better than anything they've ever had before. That's the best marketing. Um, other than that, it's we're doing a lot of uh, what we call pop-ups. So in the shopping centre, we'll take a temporary space out in the, the main traffic with a couple of girls on the desk talking to any passerbys, or give them a free toothbrush and talk about oral health and what have you. So the pop-ups are going well. We make appointments Pop-ups or when you have a human out there working the Yeah, we have a human. Working the Again, we have a human. Yep. And they're they're talking to fast yeah, cars. Yeah, yeah, saying hello. And what and what is the giving average them life? Free. Um, what is the average life expectancy of your um, associate dentist? How long does in the seventy one locations? How long does the average <laughs> dentist stay with you before they quit and move on or get a job somewhere else? Um, what is the average turnover? Okay, so the average turnover is about twenty percent. So we're turning out twenty percent a year. So one fifth we've got a large, move on every year. One one fifth move on every year. So we've we've got to get new dentists, not only to uh, cope with our expansion, but also to replace them. That figure is coming down because as the practices in general are getting the the practices in Australia are getting more competitive, uh, less patients. We're getting more dentists because we've got the patients. Because we're where remember we're in the shopping center where and the people you, are. And when you get so the, our turnover is dropping. We have some dentists who have been with the group and its predecessor for for thirty thirty five years. Um, we've got a bunch of high high end dentists who have been with us for since it started in two thousand three. Um, so it's it's about them trusting and believing and and loving the experience. Of working from one of our places and will you hire a dentist straight out of school yes straight out of school yep. and we'll mentor them we have a, me a formal mentorship program we we one of our senior dentists will have two of them as um, mentorees and they look after them but we also have formal education and they come into head office and we do some um, stuff around um, patient communication uh, record keeping impression taking all this stuff we, we we finish off their education that they didn't really get finished at at university um, well, yeah, we, we, we love we mean, lo how we love to grow grow your own you like to grow your own dentist and in fact we literally have done that one of our best dentists has been with us for 40 years and her daughter is now one of our best new graduates and what percent of your dentists are male versus female 60 percent female 40 percent male so do you, um, that's what we see in the United States. Yeah. The United States corporate dentistry is running um, two thirds women, mm. one third male. Do you think the women are more inclined to want to just have a job? Um, they're less likely to want to invest in a practice, but I'm now actually saying that about the males as well. So why would you go and invest five, six hundred thousand dollars in a practice when you can do as well at somewhere like Pacific Smiles and you spend no money getting in? So, and you get more flexibility and you don't have the staff hassles and things like that. So that's what is a real appeal. When I, back in 2003, that's what I identified. Two macro changes. Suddenly the patient was less loyal to an individual and was moving around more. So they're more loyal to their convenience. So seven days a week and such. So we had a change in the patient. No longer were they Howard Friend's patient, they were today's dental patient, see? So no longer were they Alex Abraham's patient, they were Pacific Smiles at Green Hills patient. So when I'm not there, they're happy to be there. So there was a change in the attitudes of the consumer and there was a change in the professional. The professional didn't want to own a practice like the traditional um, post-war uh, scenario where everyone wanted to own the practice. Right. Some of them still have that itch that they want to own their practice and they leave us to go and do that and some actually come back to us. So they're the two macro changes that occurred way back at the beginning of the last decade which we've capitalised on well before anyone else. So the so patient's more loyal to himself than the doctor. They're more, they're more loyal to convenience, they're more loyal to accessibility and availability and affordability than they are to the individual doctor. That's doesn't mean that when they, if they've been seeing, you know, Dr. Bailey for years, they're going to ring up and say, I normally see Ann Bailey, can I get in with her? No worries, we can do that. Or she's away for six weeks, no worries, I'll see someone else. Right. So the bolted on loyalty to an individual is gone. We don't have names on the door.
we have Pacific Smiles on the door. We'll have names on the entry to the room to identify Dr. Ferran. Did you say you're coming to work for us, by the way? Yes. All right, good. I'll, I'll find a spot for you. So Dr. Fran there, so you know who you're seeing, but often I'll find, see a friend in the street. I um, uh, uh, saw my, my daughter said her, her best friend goes to Pacific Smiles at Salamander Bay. And I said, which dentist does she see? They never and know. she said, I don't know, it's the guy with the blonde hair. Yeah, I know, I hate that in my office. And when that's a change, that's a change. They'll be on the school. telephone and they'll go, they go, which dentist is it? Well, is it the, is it the short, fat, bald guy? Or the, <laughs> the tall, good looking guy? And I'm like, hey, can you explain it some other way than that? No, no, no. That's, uh, dear, but that's that's what they remember. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, look, th there have to be a shift in egos too. So, the the egos that well, I'm going to be sexist here. The egos that men have it says I can do it. I can do it really well and stand aside, you know. And so they want to own the practice. They want to pay the wages. They want to hire the staff. They want to fire the staff. They want to do the deals with the leasing executives. They want to do the marketing and all that sort of thing because that suits their ego. What they fail to realise, they're spending 25% of their time doing low billable stuff. Because you could pay someone $30 an hour to do all that stuff. So there's an ego thing. So I really like the dentists who don't have the really strong egos. Right. So I call it the middle patch. The personality dentist up the top here, we're never going to attract them. Because they're too interested in having the top drawer organized the way they want it organized. That's fine. I'm not going to say they're, 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 they're a lesser person because of that, but they need to own their own four walls and everything inside it. And then you have the, the, the low level ones who you know, really need to work in a supportive situation like government clinics and, and what have you. So we want the stuff in the middle there. And we do well with it. Um. You know, I want to say a caveat, a lot of you might be wondering, wow, he only spends one half percent on marketing. I thought most people crushing it are spending three to five percent on marketing. But you got to remember that the people who have to spend five percent on marketing are in medical dental buildings where no one can find them. If you have um, location, 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 if you have visibility, your rent actually is, is your part marketing. marketing. So, so we in, in the shopping centers, we're paying a shitload of money for rent. But I justify it on the basis of about one third of that rent is foot traffic. Right, sure. But you've got to take advantage of that by being open seven days a week. But as long as you've got the patients, you keep the dentist happy, you employ staff, they're happy. We're a big employer. We're over a thousand employees. So we're actually uh, achieving a lot by making ourselves successful by helping a lot of other people. So you have, but you're exactly right. Dentists, you, have, you have 350 50 dentists, dentists yeah. and 1,000 employees. Yeah. Wow. So you're averaging three employees per doctor. No, no, we're two employees per doctor, but you've got head office people, you've got part-timers. I'm, I'm only talking about human beings. Oh. There's a lot of, when you go... So full-time equivalents... Full-time equivalent is, is two, two to staff, one. Two to one. Yep. And that's how you keep your labor at 20%. Yeah. So we don't have... We, like, when I travelled to America and been over to see uh, Heartland and Pacific Dental and Aspen, and one thing that impressed us, well, didn't impress us, but alerted us, was this three-to-one thing happening in America. But you've got someone employed just to do the health fund stuff, the insurance stuff, because you've got to, got to get pre-approval for everything, or most things. You don't have to get that here. So we, we as doctors have medical sovereignty know, to, be so able to, to be able to do it, go and do it, and then build the health fund. Now, if, they, if they've blown their annual limits, you know, that's the patient's problem, not ours. Yeah, it, it's so sad because uh, you know, there's a big debate on the, the cost of health care. Mm. And the last president wanted everyone to be covered, but the cost went off the scene. But it's just typical government that they had this grand idea to cover everyone, but they didn't have any ideas on how yeah. to cut costs. Yeah. Yeah. And one third of the cost of the whole healthcare scheme in America is freaking paperwork. Yeah, and they could have eliminated, they could have cut it in half a hundred different ways, yeah. but they never have an idea yeah. to cut cost. And, you know, they just have ideas to give more shit away for free. Yeah, yeah. And in Singapore, it's about four to five percent. Yeah.
in America, crazy. it's a third. It's the, you're the highest there. And usually, the smart people in America um, copy off the smart Asian kid at the front of the room. Yeah. They could have just gone to Singapore. They could have just copied Taiwan. Mm -hmm. They could have copied Singapore. They could have copied the smart Asian kid. Yeah. Yeah. But they yeah. just, they just, they just. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, um, so um, when you do marketing, what do you think is more important? Um, your accessibility, easy to find your availability, the hours, or are you doing Facebook ads, Google AdWords, yeah, we do, direct we're, mail? We're doing a bit of Facebook, a uh, bit of Google. Um, we'll have campaigns around uh, a new center opening. So we'll, we'll do um, location services around that, that area. Um, it depends. You, you, if, if someone's got a toothache, it's availability. I want to. I want to be seen before lunch today. So you've got to have the urgent care spot already pre-allocated in the book. You've got to be open. If it's Sunday, you want to be open, and you've got um, urgent care spots there. So you have a whole bunch of people who want, who need urgent care. So that's a, a different appeal in terms of those three things to someone who's trying to balance a budget and wants it to be affordable. So we have a thing called Dental Wise, which you can join and get pay a monthly fee. So you can pay do a payment through the year, and you can depending which one you choose, one or two checkups a year, you get ten percent off your your fees. And you get so other this things. is your own in office in insurance office plan, Dental Wise, and yeah. it's called Dental Wise. Is it a separate website? Yeah, yeah, Dental Wise separate website. So is it dentalwise.com.au? Dental so dentalwise.com. So that's it's your just own. being rolled out. We've, we've been piloting it in a couple of centers and this year we'll be rolling that out so that's helping people Will you roll it out to non-pacific group not at this stage so it'll still be a proprietary yeah uh competitive advantage just for yeah. pacific smuggers yeah. so when you went to america and you studied rick workman's heartland dental steve thorne's pacific dental group um aspen dental yeah. what did you did you learn anything yeah. to do or did you mostly okay. learn things not to I'll, do? i'll go back we did that in 2009 we went over I'll go back to 2005, we went to the UK. Uh, the CEO, John Gibbs, and myself, he's still the CEO. Uh, we went to the UK, and there we looked at um, uh, the corporates there, uh, Oasis um, um, and a few others. And what we learnt there was what not to do, which was basically the roll-up strategy. They had a roll-up strategy, they did it very fast, and they didn't know how to manage all these practices. We came back uh, the only thing we picked out of that was the um, dental plan idea that they have in the UK. So that's where dental wise is a bit based on the dental plan ideas. When we went to America, we were really impressed with um, the location of the Pacific um, Services one. They are in, in the shopping malls, on the edge of the shopping malls. Okay, um, now shopping malls. You, okay, so in America, a mall means like a huge one building, two or three stories yeah. tall. That's a mall. Oh, okay. But a retail center. Yeah, they're on the edge of retail centers. Yeah, retail. That, they had an attempt at being fairly consistent, um, but I must admit, Aspen were the best on consistency. We were really impressed with their training of new dentists. They brought them into the head office for a week. Um, they were consistent in all their uh, forms and the Does way you mean they did. Fontana, um, the CEO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's his first name? Um, Is it Joe Font? Mar Mark Fontan, Joe Fontan? Fontan? The, the, yeah, Fontan. yeah. You know, we were impressed with him. We were also starting to look at how people were doing their IT um, because we had a dispersed um, IT system. We had servers in each office, but uh, Aspen had this consolidated um, model. Which on the cloud, were, you mean? Well, at that stage, it wasn't the cloud. Yeah. It was on big servers and everything, but we liked that idea. But our connectivity in, a, in this country isn't good enough for that, but now it's, it's getting there now. So I was in, we were impressed with Aspen. We came back thinking we've got to have a cookie cutter approach. So we didn't do any new centers for 12 months while we went back and redesigned everything we did to a cookie cutter approach. I think one and of the, was useful. the smartest things I... Um, and, and sorry, Heartland to complete, Heartland looked after their dentists well. They engaged well with their dentists. So we, 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 we got that side of it. So you thought Heartland's core competency was engaging the dentist yeah 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 we spoke to a few of the dentists who worked in heartland and they were just raving about it yeah i think um heartland keeps their doctors the longest yeah and i think it's because they have um the most continued education programs yeah. and they're they're long programs like yeah. two-year implant system yeah. courses 
Um, I think Aspen, what Aspen does best is um, American dentists all want to go to where all the rich people live yeah. and do full mouth rehab. And Aspen goes to the underserved poor dentures. areas and with Medicaid. And actually, I think one of the best corporate changes is affordable dentures. Yeah. Because every dentist I know hates dentures. Yeah, so we're looking at that at the moment. So they um, go to all the we, areas we, with a bunch of trailer parks, a bunch yeah. of retirees, a yeah. bunch of senior citizens yeah. with removable, and they set up amazing affordable dentures, and they're able, and it's the... Um, so they'd have a lab as well, would they? Yeah, they and, and what they do that's genius is they always go into an area and they advertise the lowest price for an extraction. Like They'll say like $69 for an extraction. Mm. Well, no one comes in for one extraction. No. Usually they're coming in for, if someone's coming in for an extraction. Particularly in those areas. They got a lot of dental work done. I mean, when's the last time you had a tooth extracted? Yeah. So when someone's coming in and say, yeah, I need this tooth extracted, my God, they need a whole TREMA plan of dentistry. So they go with the lowest extraction price and um, and then they're, they advertise a very low cost denture but then they have a higher cost denture yeah. with like Ibuclair, I've seen, I've seen their website, Blue Tape, yeah. and then they have, mm. um, and then that denture on two implants, mm. or maybe on four implants mm. and a O bar, all the way to so all you, on you, four. It's a, it's successful. It's very successful. Yeah. Extremely successful. I think they have a hundred locations. Yeah, and they um, it's it's a it's a cash cow, and I, I think um, so I think you know they know their market. They have they have a market well, they're, focus. They're, they're, they're appealing around the affordable denture tagline mm -hmm. so yes i need a denture good idea i want it to be affordable they must be good at doing dentures so this and then is where they, i think they, they and just, then if they they upsell 20 percent yeah to an implant supported yeah, denture yeah so it's the opposite end to the high ego high personality dentist right yeah exactly and that's where the orthodontics from the 80s to roll up you know and any 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 attempt by by business people to roll up a, a special group of specialists generally ends in tears because you can't make a buck out of it unless you control the professional but the professional doesn't want to be controlled right but we have you roll found, up specialists you'll end in tears that's yeah that's classic. so we don't have many specialists in our group a few orthodontists and a couple of endodontists but they just come and go a little bit they on a sessional basis they it's not their main game so um but we just good dentists. Quite a few of them can do wisdom teeth till the cows come home. Can do implants and what have you because they've gone out and got an extra education. So we you talked about um, a lot about implants. Yeah. Um, what about Invisalign? Do you try to teach all your doctors how to do Invisalign? Yeah, yeah, yes, we've got quite a few who've done the course. We don't do the course ourselves, but um, people who do Invisalign courses uh, do that. And um, uh, is that uh, a very is that a it's very not lucrative. Part of rough, um, the trouble with, and again, not wanting to up, up offend people in the profession, but Invisalign take the majority of the fee. If you think about what the patient pays, for it to be economical for the patient, Invisalign takes the majority of the fee. Because what's the lab fee on an Invisalign case? Well, I don't know. It's three to four thousand dollars. You know. So particularly, I mean, if you're doing lots of them, you'll get a better deal from Invisalign. But they control the market. You know, yeah. it's a great product. It's a fantastic but product. You're saying it's a better deal. It's a for shift. It's, it's a it's a fee shift from from the dentist to the lab. It's like, you know, using the lab that you spoke of earlier in um, uh, the, the three hundred fifty dollar crowns. But to get Invisalign, you don't have the flexibility. There's there's not a there's not enough market um, pressure, and not enough providers in that space to create uh, pressure on the market. So the the, the patient fee, uh, instead of it no more than a third going to the lab, it's a fair bit. So when you do put it in the calculation to some of our dentists, that's not is not uh, financially viable. So and unless same, you charge the patient a lot more. Same question: A lot of kids are wondering: Is, uh, is sleep apnea a great uh, snore guard? Sleep apnea is that a great lucrative thing to get into? Um, it's actually a, a crisis out there with people with sleep apnea and the crisis on work and driving and risk is huge. Unfortunately, certainly in this country, Medicare and the health funds don't seem to recognise the significance of it, so they don't pay well on it. So invariably, it ends up being a private expenditure by the patient. And so sleep apnea devices uh, have to be done for $2,000 because you've got to pay seven or eight hundred dollars to the lab 
and there's not much in the middle to manage it. So it's not a big, uh, there's not a lot, a lot of demand so for then, it. So then what are you mostly focused on, just back to basics? Basic cleaning. Genesis. So, so well, we're not just cleaning, but we do the whole gamut of uh, restoration Which work. is what? So, well, so it, it, direct composites, indirect composites, composite veneers, uh, porcelain veneers, um, uh, implants for the dentists who've been through the courses, um, uh, good wholesome, basic, middle of the road dentistry. Yeah, look, we really believe in having good oral hygiene and good oral health will lead to better whole body health. And that's one of the things we really... So you're mostly doing cleaning exams, x-rays, fillings, crowns, and root canals. Yep, root canals. And extractions. Yep, implants, dentures. So bread and butter dentistry. Bread and butter dentistry. Yeah. Um, a bit of ortho, but a lot of that... If I, if I think about what gets referred uh, from... The, the majority of stuff that would get referred would be orthodontics, uh, complex molar endo, and complex oral surgery would get referred. The rest of the stuff we do tend to handle. We have general anaesthetics for the kids and, and such that we have. And um, what about urban versus rural? Yeah, well, um, it's working. Both are working for us. Um, we started out more rural, or we call it regional, um, because there were less dentists per... 10,000 people. Um, so it was just natural that there would be a marketplace there for it. But harder to get the dentist to that area because they like to be in the city. Uh, city, easier to get the dentist, harder to get the patient. And that's cute though, their, their mom migrated here all the way from uh, India or Sri Lanka. Mm. And then the second generation, you can't even get them to go one hour out of town. No. no. <laughs> it's like your mom Your mom came uh, 6,000 miles from Sri Lanka mm. or Bali or Indonesia for you to have a better life, mm. and you won't go an hour That's out of right. town. Um, I mean, the, 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 all the uh, associations here, the dental associations, what have you, are crying that there are too many dentists in the country. We don't have too many dentists. We have a maldistribution of dentists. Sure. There's too many who want to be 10 kilometres from the CBD and not enough that want to be more than 100 kilometres from the CBD. Within one kilometre of the opera house is 200 dentists. I mean, every dentist wants to have an office that overlooks the, yeah. the, the, the Sydney Harbour but Opera the House. The smart dentist is somewhere out in the western suburbs or the southern suburbs. He yeah. might live in the eastern suburbs, but he drives out there to see his patients. Well, um, I um, can't believe I was so lucky that you came all the way to the Hyatt Regency in downtown Sydney, overlooking this beautiful harbor, <laughs> and come talk uh, to all my homies today. Um, you just said so many, so many profound things. It was so informative, and it's so nice to get someone on here who walks the talk. Because a lot of times I'll listen to a consultant and I'll say, well, does that consultant have an office? Is this all talk? That's Is there right. any walk? Yeah. And th here's a guy that's publicly traded, owns 70 offices, and everything he says is spot on. And what's sad is that the condition of the human is you don't want to hear spot on. You want to hear what you want to believe. Yeah. And so many people just are making a fortune off dentists telling you what you want to hear, telling you what you want to believe. They do it in politics. They do it in religion. They do it in practice management. And here's a guy, another um, just real world guy with 70 office telling you some very brutal facts. And I know my homies love you to death. I know a lot of this stuff you didn't want to hear. But it's true. I mean, they don't want to hear that you need to open on evenings and weekends and Saturdays no, no. and Sundays. They want to hear you say, no one shows up on Saturday. No one comes nope. up on Sunday. And you should have this big staff doing all your cleanings and all your help, even though the insurance fees are, are going down every year, every year, every year. But thank you so much for coming right. by. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, you're, you're awesome, buddy. <laughs> Good.